to the Talent Optimization Podcast, the go-to podcast for CEOs and HR professionals wanting to bridge the gap between the strategy and tactical implementation of talent optimization within their organizations. Through interviews, predictive index, and personal experience, your host, Tracy Shirk, helps you discover the facets of talent optimization from both a CEO and HR perspective to truly create the dream team for your organization. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to Talent Optimization. My name is Tracy Shirk, and today we are talking about how we not only care for ourselves, but how we really care for and about the people inside of our organizations. And do I have the probably one of the best people with us to chat about how HR rises and how we bring purpose into what we're doing in HR? And so with me today is Steve Brown. And so Steve, welcome to our show. Hi, Tracy. It's great to be here. You too. And so, you know, Steve, you posted something on LinkedIn this week called OneNote and kind of your love for Pops, Symphony, et cetera, and how it only takes one note to have an incredible impact. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about it? Because you can say it better than I can. I think that people are passionate. It's just that, will they show it or not? We think it takes so much effort and big moves and giant shifts when honestly, it's one thing. If you can unlock that one thing, the piece that I heard in the pops, one note started to swell from the violins and I wept. I'm like, oh my gosh, such beautiful things. When I think of the people that we work with, we get hung up in all the junk outside instead of trying to find that one thing that can unlock who they are and the talented person they are in order for them to do well and perform. Absolutely. Because every single one of us is created perfectly the way we are. Yet we are not created perfectly for every job and we are not created perfectly for every organization. (laughs) Very true. Very, very true. (laughs) So how have you gone about finding that one thing for yourself and then for others? Well, interestingly, the one thing for me is to unlock it in others. And I'll give you a great example. In our pizzerias, People come from all kinds of backgrounds and people can start working with us when they're 16. So I'll go into the pizzeria and walk back to the cook line. I skip the managers. I go to the cooks. I find out something about them. And so I found out at one of our stores, a person was studying a culinary degree. So they're cooking and studying culinary things. So I said, hey, when I come back, can we talk more about what you've learned from a culinary perspective? They went, well, sure. The manager said, I didn't know they were going to school. And I said, but now that you do, why don't you ask them how school is going? I don't have to be the only person. So it's equipping others on how to unlock this in others makes it much richer. And people appreciate their people more than they do. So for me, that fills my bucket like you wouldn't believe. So I spend most of my day talking. And if I do that, it's a good day. Absolutely. So what has been kind of the secret sauce at La Rosa's of how you've been able to do that and really have your managers step into that as well when they didn't realize that that was something that could unlock it for them? I think two things. One, I had an incredible boss, Kevin, and I said had only because he passed away in December of 2020. But he kind of opened the door and said, tell me how to do this. Show us how to do something different. Be yourself. He was like that with everybody, not just me. So he would give you a lot more latitude as a leader to say, here's your out of bounds. And I'm going to just understand when you go out of bounds, we're talking. But if you don't go out of bounds, go crazy. And it was a really broad set of parameters, not defined, agreed upon by person based on who they are and what they do and what their scope is and all these other factors. And when he did that, I went from going to the pizzerias and everybody going, shh, here comes HR. And I was like, hey, Steve's here. What's going on? So when we crossed over that and it became more of that personal connection, then things opened up all over. Yeah, absolutely. And what's so interesting about that is when we give individuals more ownership, so often it takes that overwhelm off of us because we're giving them the ability to do it the way that it works for them. And it doesn't have to work for us as long as we're clear on what those outcomes are. 
I absolutely agree. And, you know, what's so interesting is when we're chatting with new managers about this, so often it's like, oh no, it's, we have to have very specific and we have to follow it. And I'm going, how much pressure and stress is that actually putting on you? you know? <laughs> right. I'll give you a great example. I love what you're saying and how you're approaching it. I ask people what they're focusing on that day. Instead of saying, what are you doing today? Right. Or, because the answer is, I'm busy. Well, is that good? <laughs> it's just that you're busy. I got it. But if I say, what are you focusing on? And they said, oh, gosh, you know, we got to make sure the fryers are clean. And da, 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 da. I'm like, okay, do you need to be the one doing that? Or can I have Tracy do that so I can have you focus on other good things? This has value. I get it. And fryers don't talk back. Right. I need you over here with people. And how can I get you there? So instead of focusing on what people aren't doing, assessing where they are, seeing where they're focused, and then help them shift if they need to. Absolutely. You know, and you said something really amazing at the beginning of the conversation, and that was we hire 16-year-olds. And, you know, with hiring 16-year-olds, what I know, you know, what I know about you, Steve, is that you have a way of creating a pathway through the organization for those 16-year-olds so that work is meaningful. Do you want to share a little bit about that and how that has worked? We are the first company that truly that I've worked for that promotes from within. Our CEO, former CEO, was a dishwasher. Yeah. And uh, our current CEO has the name on the building, but he also started sweeping parking lots. So we see the talent in people and move them ahead. But in order to do that, you have to know your people, really know them. So we've kind of put this into our culture and we have the path that if you want to be here for decades, you can be. Mm -hmm. If you want to be here for a year, you can be. If you want to be here for five years and three days, you can be. There's two different things. There's the do well with where you're at and kill it. And then grow if you want to and we want you to. There's a difference. Some companies go, I want to grow. You go, gosh, we know. <laughs> Other people say, I'm not sure I want to grow. And we go, oh, no, we want you to grow. So we look at growth and retention differently than a lot of companies. We grow you wide and deep, knowing that you'll move up. We don't move up first and go, right. uh-oh, they're not ready. But if they're wide and deep, you can't help it. You'll see people rise, and then people will get to choose to stay at the company instead of trying to form straight path. Very few of our people go in straight path. Right. They bounce all over. Absolutely. Because there's that institutional knowledge, but you know what, there's a true skill set of being a dishwasher or something that you learn. My 16 year old son just did a dishwashing job and he's like, mom, it was the worst job I ever had. And I said, okay, Q, but what did you learn? And he's like, mom, I learned how hard it actually is. And I learned that I'm the last person there, the one being paid the least, but yet I have one of the most important jobs because nobody wants their dishes when they come back dirty. And what I'm doing is making it so everyone else can do their job well. And that was actually fulfilling. I said, great. He's like, but I'm done. I said, that's okay. You had the experience. That's right. He learned. That's yeah, great. Exactly. And sometimes that's the only outcome we need for them and for us. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so something interesting you talked about as they want to grow or we want them to grow. You know, one of the big conversations that we've been having and that I've been hearing as the HR chatter lately has been this kind of distinction between, you know, a talent pathway that's a leadership talent pathway and a talent pathway that's a specialist talent pathway that you can become the best. We're playing with dishwashers right now. The best dishwasher that everybody goes to, but you never want to manage people. So how do you handle that? I think there's a couple of things to look at. Know the people's strengths and generally assess that. Yeah. So if someone has more people-oriented strengths, because if you're a leader at La Rosa's, you have to be people-oriented. It's not just, I want to be an X. Because mm -hmm. you can do that, but you're going to have dead bodies everywhere. We have a great example. Nancy does our menu analysis. And it's a job. Wow. I mean, 
So if Tracy has an allergy, we know how to answer it. If the price of cheese is this, this is what it costs. She's an amazing specialist. And she's so good at that. She doesn't have to manage others, but she manages an area of business, which has value. Yeah. You can still do well, be compensated well, get bonuses, all that kind of stuff, but not be responsible for people. There are other people that are great people leaders, but may not be as in-depth specialists. Mm -hmm. They're good at broad pictures. The people that can really think and act strategically on a regular basis, that's who I want in charge of people. And so we try and distinguish that we're small enough that we know our people well enough to do that on an ongoing basis. The other factor from an HR thing is to make sure that someone isn't overlooked, that someone isn't discriminated against, that someone is, that if there's equity, all those good HR things, but instead of making them a program, they're a factor in consideration all the time. Absolutely. And that's that really strong foundation. And when you've got that foundation that's really strong, you can do all the other things on top of it because you've got a great base that you can fall back upon. And, you know, so one of the things that we've kind of heard and talked a lot about over the last two years is how the world has changed. You know, this, you can't find workers, which I don't believe is true. I believe workers are out there. We just have to tap them on the shoulder and know exactly who we're looking for. But with that being said, how have you been able to find your best sources of individuals coming in and then the growing within, which if you're growing within and keeping your folks, you don't have to recruit as much either. True. I think it's, we want to give you all the information you need to know who we are, what you'll do, and how you can contribute, and then choose. So if one of your factors don't fall into one of those three things, go work for another place. We'd hate to lose you, but if that's what you want to do, great. What we found, though, is we're hiring better because we know those three things. We tell you up front, when you work here, this is what it's like. This is the environment here. Here's the culture. Here's the managers. Here's the job expectations. Here's the highs. Here's the lows. Here's the comp. Here's the benefits, but we're going to talk about all this other stuff before we even think about these comp and benefits. Those are givens, okay? Right. Those are expectations. And they go, well, if it's really like that. I want to be a part of that. When someone self-chooses to work for us, we get them. And yeah. we hold on to them for quite a bit. If someone takes us because it's an opportunity and they kind of buy in, they'll be here for a short period of time, and we're okay with that. The big shift we had to do, though, Tracy, was I've been here 15 years, and I still have some of the least seniority in the company. So it's, it's a challenge. So you have to say, in the new workforce, in the new landscape that we have, how can I make it amazing for the time that you're here? Yeah. And if it's three months, let's kill it for three. If it's a year and a half, let's make it amazing for that year and a half. And then with grace, allow them to do their next thing. Right. That way, we get people to stick a lot more than expecting them to be here 15 years, 20 years, because those days are long past. Right. But when you can create, I lovingly call it happy alumni that look back on La Rosa's and say, you know what, that was one of the best experiences because of X, Y, Z, and I learned, and they were transparent. You get the boomerangers that will come back maybe after they finish the next stint, or maybe the grass isn't greener on the other side, right? Yeah, we've had boomerang uh, team members, and they're wonderful. And they've told us why, and we're really good with it. Uh, We also have generational hiring, which I don't, I've never been in a company like this. So I work here, then my son works here, then my daughter works here, and then they grow up, and then their children work here. It's phenomenal what the core people that have been part of with a part of us over the years, it doesn't go away. It's a huge factor. And that's amazing. And especially when you have the reputation out in the community of this is a great place to work and you're kind of shadowing that and the kids are talking about it because they're excited about what mom and dad are doing. And that means mom and dad are talking positively about work at home as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I just, yesterday I did a speaking engagement to an HR community, a SHRM chapter, and there were 65 folks in the room. And one of the things that I asked them 
is what are your must-haves, your like-to-haves, and your dream-to-haves for the culture that you want to be in? It could be current or it could be what you would dream that that organizational culture looks like. You know, and the answers were really, really interesting from we must have really good transparent communication to, you know what, I would dream to have a culture where we can bring dogs to work or, you know, (laughs) that's not going to work at La Rosa's, right? However, you know, but you know what, I would dream to have an organization where we have employee resource groups and we can really get to know each other and have that ability for really strong collaboration. And I'm curious, what would that like must have, like to have, dream to have, or what is that for, for La Rosa's? And what do you see within that for our HR community? That's a really great question. And it was loaded. Sorry, I didn't mean That's to have okay. it so loaded. That's okay. I think, <laughs> I think our must-haves are you need to be relationship-based. Yeah. If you're not relationship-based, you're not going to do well here. So you might be very talented, very skilled, but if you can't hang with the people side, I mean, it's in your bones here. It's crazy. I tell people when they're new, I say, now listen, when you say, I live over here, they're going to ask you a million zillion questions. Not to be intrusive, they just want to know you. If that bothers you, it's going to be hard. So a must-have is if you're not genuinely relationship-based, you're going to struggle. The wish to have is that people would be a little more graceful under pressure. We tend to elevate everything to a pressure situation when it's not always the case. But it's a pressure situation for us, so therefore, I bleed on other people. We use the four agreements here, and one of the things is don't take it personally. Don't take things personally. Well, that's just near impossible. But behind that, we were talking about yesterday at our exec meeting. It's everybody has a personal hell. Don't bring them into yours. <laughs> and I went, oh, I like that a lot. Because yeah. we tend yeah. to get sucked in like, oh, this is happening at Tracy's house with her son. Ugh. And you go, show grace. Listen to her. Understand. Show empathy. But it doesn't mean we have to get swallowed by it. And yeah. when pressure happens, we tend not to be as graceful as we always could be. We're pretty good. I'd love to see it improve. And the dream to have is this. I would love to see us and HR professionals specifically have the same ability that I've been fortunate to have. I work throughout the business. I have no questions. No one, you know, says, why is he here? Or what? It's more, why isn't he involved? We we need him there. And my team, not just me. So I think HR people have to quit being in the shadows thinking that's where they have to live because that's how they've been treated or how the company views it. We have to say, no, because there are humans, we are everywhere. Yeah. And uh, it took some time to teach my team that. They're amazing. Yeah. Very, very talented people. But now that they do this other part, they're like, this is awesome. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, and one of those things, and I'd love to get your kind of take on this, that I found through working with HR folks and working with executives inside the business is so often there's a disconnect between what the business outcomes are that HR believes they are and what the business outcomes are that the executive team believes that they are. And Mm -hmm. until that conversation can like come together and truly understand that, yep, we are on the same page, we're marching in the same direction, that's really hard to have happen. But when that conversation can start to get on the same page, uh, we are 100% in alignment with which the HR goals are because that people plans what's needed in order for the business results to actually happen. You're not going to get business results without people, period. Right, right, right. I think we frame it as with people, you drive the results. Oh, I like that. We switched it around. Most companies, including ours, we use results to lead. Last year, we did this. This year, we're doing this. That's a difference of X percent. And then in HR circles, we go, oh, we need to learn this. Well, that's simple math. Stop it. Instead of saying, since we're seeing these results, what's driving that? So it's more of an operational view of because I have this talent and they're doing this, it should yield these results. But if it doesn't, what's happening? Instead of saying results first, results first, results are results by definition. They're at the end. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I would rather see HR go, I can help you drive results through your people because completely different. Fantastic. I love it. You know, and you mentioned something in your wish to have list, which is, you know, really how when things are coming in for your team, how they interpret that. So like the quit taking it personally and whatnot, you know, one, you mentioned one of your great mentors earlier. And one of my great mentors said to me at one point, she goes, Tracy, one of the ways that I look at this is I almost have to have this bubble around me where when somebody throws their crap at me, it doesn't stick to me because I have enough of my own kind of self-worth and self-confidence that I can just look at them and say, thank you for sharing that. That's your baggage. If there's a way I can help, great, but I don't have to take it with me. <laughs> I love that. I, I absolutely agree. And like, and all I could think was, oh my gosh, like, I don't want to walk around in a bubble, but like that bubble analogy completely shifted my mindset into, wow, I don't have to take everything that's thrown at me in HR and because it's their stuff and it does, even though they're putting it on my desk, I don't have to take it on my desk. That's right. And it's impossible to carry it all. As much as you think you can, the more you do that, you just start diminishing what you can do for good because it will swallow you. There's just no doubt about it. Absolutely. And I think in a way that leads us to, you know, May's Mental Health Awareness Month, we're talking about, you know, HR self-care and some of those things. And some of that is, you know, separating what it is you can control and what it is you can't. It is. I, I think on top of that, doing things like this, connecting with your peers, having somebody who you can go to. One of the things we have in our company is, where can I dump my bucket? So if I come to you and we have that good relationship, I go, Tracy, I just got to dump my bucket. If it's about us, not as good. But even in that, if it's safe and you just go, I can talk to Tracy and it's good. Internally as HR people, it's almost impossible because of what we deal with, the confidentiality we have. And it shouldn't be all this exaggerated situational happenings. But you need to have someone who's in your corner. Mm-hmm. And you have to go, it's reciprocal. Boy, can I reach out to you and just have five minutes? That release is not done nearly enough. And when it's not released healthy with your peers, it comes out somewhere else and it comes out in unhealthy ways. So we shouldn't be HR martyrs where we just die on the sword. We should have peers that lift us up. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and that's so interesting because that is actually one of the reasons why within our organization, I went and got my coach certification and I actually coach groups of HR professionals because you, especially when you're in a smaller company and you're a one person HR team, you don't have anyone you can go and have those conversations with where it's like, hey, how are you being in that situation where you're either contributing to it or, you know, you're making it better, (laughs) (laughs) but also dumping the bucket. I love that analogy. And you've created a really amazing HR community. I see now our listeners can't see what's behind you, but I see your lava lamps going behind you and you've created this amazing HR community. Do you want to share a little bit about that? I've wanted to be somebody who brings people together. Not to focus on me. In fact, when it starts getting that way, I get a little weird. But I don't think there have been enough people in our field that believe in others and what we do. I would have tried to be the person that says, Tracy, I believe in what you do and this is why. And I do it. I don't believe in you because like it's a raw, raw cheerleader. We do the same types of things. And if we have HR people who believe in each other, genuinely believe in each other, then goodness gracious, you can do all kinds of stuff that you never dreamt of doing. And you'll learn from people that can give you tools and ideas and approaches and skills that you can't gather on your own. So to give people forums to do that, whether it's on Twitter or on the HR net, which I run, which you know goes out to 13,000 people, and it just says, I'm going to put it in your lap. I'm not going to ask you anymore. I'm just going to put it right in front of you. Sharing the work of others, lifting other things up. Look at this blog. Listen to this podcast. Someone has to be that connector in our profession. People are kind enough to let me do that. So more often than not, it allows people to be the incredible, diverse, talented people that they are 
to still connect with their peers. I love it. So as we start to kind of close on our conversation today, what is the takeaway that you have for the executives that have listened into our conversation today? For executives, I'd love for them to take a look at themselves and say, how are we leading from a people first lens? Or are we leading from a people first lens? And then understand whatever HR talent they have is ready and able and willing to help that come to life. And it's more of a business prerogative than you think. If you keep ignoring it, it's still happening. So I would love for executives to say, because I have people who drive results, what are we doing as an organization to be people first on purpose? Awesome. And then what's your takeaway for our HR professionals listening in today? Well, something so I'm, <laughs> something that I'm working on now and something I'm going to try and push forward here before the end of the year is quit being in the shadows. If you keep hearing the term, I have to go to HR, it tells you where you are in the organization automatically. Yeah. Instead of saying, I work with Steve. I work with Tracy, I work with Paul, I work with Ahmad. If I work with those people, I'm part of the organization or I'm integrated throughout the organization. We can't keep being the department that's a go-to. We have to be in the organization all the time. So I, I just want us to get out of the shadows and own that a lot more. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. And if you're interested in Learning more about Steve, we will have his Twitter along with HRNet and LaRose's within the show notes so that you can follow him and find out more of what he's up to and how he's working to get HR out of the shadows. So thank you for being with us this week and be sure to join us next week when we have Julie Devlin with us from UKG. So with that being said, have a great rest of your week. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Talent Optimization Podcast. You'll find more tools and resources for CEOs and HR professionals looking to bridge the strategies versus implementation gap of talent optimization at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. We've also created a free, valuable resource for you to begin bridging the gap called the Talent Optimization Foundation Membership Program. You can access it for free at elevatedtalentconsulting.com forward slash foundation. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode to learn more about talent optimization and creating a dream team for your organization.